At the end of 1895, in less than seven weeks, Wilhelm Röntgen went from here to here. The X-ray photograph that made Röntgen world famous is of his wife's hand. So, here's the man who experimented on his wife with mysterious rays. To be fair to Röntgen, he'd already experimented on himself in downright dangerous ways. Like putting his eye close to an X-ray emitter to find out if he could see the rays. Right now, I'd like to kill a couple of myths I've come across about Röntgen's discovery. Firstly, it wasn't accidental. Röntgen was hunting for high-frequency radiation. Secondly, I keep reading that when she saw the X-ray of her hand, Bertha said, I have seen my own death. Depending on the source, and they're all modern, she was. And how were the words said? Again, depending on source, they were. What do you think, Bertha? By all accounts, Röntgen was a rather shy man who loved his wife. He would have told her what to expect when he x-rayed her hand. Maybe you know of a reliable late 19th century source for Bertha's words. Tell me in the comments if you do. Anyway, back to the science. It's 1895 and neither electrons nor radioactivity have been discovered yet. But a lot of scientists were having a lot of fun with electron beams. They called them cathode rays. Röntgen was playing with one of his very own cathode ray tubes on a Friday afternoon, accelerating electrons from a cathode using a high voltage. When the cathode rays, or in other words, electrons, hit the glass at the end of the tube, they produced a green glow in a darkened room. You can see the size of a cathode ray tube viewed end-on in this photo taken in 1896, which I'll come back to later. Röntgen had seen the green fluorescent glow of cathode rays hitting glass many times before. Hermann von Helmholtz had urged Röntgen to hunt for high-frequency radiation in line with Maxwell's equations. Helmholtz had also urged Heinrich Hertz to seek electromagnetic radiation. Hertz had used high-voltage electrical equipment and found radio waves low-frequency electromagnetic waves. Röntgen hoped to use high voltages to find electromagnetic waves at high frequencies. To detect these theoretical rays, he coated paper with small crystals of barium platinocyanide. These look yellow in visible light and fluoresce green, glowing in the dark when hit by cathode rays or ultraviolet light. Röntgen hoped, rightly, that the crystals would glow if higher frequency waves than UV hit them. On Friday, November 7th, 1895, Röntgen had darkened his lab. He covered the cathode ray tube with darkened paper. He didn't want to see the glass glow. I'm tempted to add under his feet, but that would be too bad a joke, even for me. In the pitch darkness, he noticed a barium platinocyanide screen a meter away from the cathode ray tube was glowing. The glow couldn't be caused by cathode rays. They were contained within the tube. It couldn't be UV light. The room was dark and the tube was covered. Every time the high voltage caused cathode rays to flow in the tube, the barium platinocyanide glowed. If he moved the platinocyanide closer to the tube, the crystals glowed brighter. The crystals would have turned a dark red if given enough exposure to x-rays, but Röntgen tended not to take note of colours. He was red-green colour blind. He put things like books between the cathode ray tube and the screen, but the screen went on glowing. Röntgen found his rays could travel through all sorts of materials with only minor lessening of their intensity. The rays could be blocked using dense metals like lead and platinum. 1.5 millimeters of lead blocked nearly all the rays. Röntgen knew he was onto something big. He lived in his lab for the next few days. He slept there and didn't allow anyone else in, not even his usual assistants. Then he saw something both wonderful and horrific. When he put his hand between the tube and the screen, he saw a shadowy image of the bones in his fingers. You don't need a photographic plate to see the effects of x-rays. You can see them live on a fluorescent screen. Poor Wilhelm Röntgen began worrying that he was hallucinating these skeletal images. Not surprisingly, Bertha noticed a change in his behaviour. The reply he gave his worried wife was hardly reassuring. Bertha told people later that she went through a dreadful time. On December the 22nd, just over six weeks after he first saw the crystal screen glowing, Röntgen took that world-changing x-ray photo of Bertha's hand. He could see it, she could see it. He wasn't going crazy. 
Here's what was happening. The high voltage accelerated electrons to high speeds, about half the speed of light. If an electron hitting the glass loses a lot of its kinetic energy in a single event, the energy is converted to an X-ray photon. Less than 1% of electron impacts made X-rays. Nevertheless, huge numbers of X-ray photons were made. <coughs> That's the sound of X-rays being made. Well, not really. All the X-rays that made that image of Bertha's hand came from a process called Bremstrahlung, which is German for breaking radiation. When a car stops, its brakes convert its kinetic energy to thermal energy. Brakes can get very hot. Likewise, a rapidly decelerating electron can convert its kinetic energy into an X-ray photon. Electrons passing close to the nucleus of an atom, in this case in the glass end of the cathode ray tube, are slowed down rapidly by their attraction to the positive charge. The kinetic energy lost by the electron is converted to the energy of an X-ray photon. Here's the setup at Wesley College a few weeks after Röntgen announced his discovery to the world. Cathode ray tubes were common in labs, and hundreds of workers all over the world were soon replicating and building on Röntgen's discovery. A Ruhmkorff coil is generating high voltage pulses. Wires from the coil lead to the cathode and anode of the tube. When cathode rays hit the glass, X-rays fly off in all directions. Some of them go downward and pass through the hand. The bones block far more rays than the fleshy part does, so the photographic plate covered with cardboard below the hand produces an X-ray photograph showing the bones. X-rays weren't limited to hands, of course. Here's an X-ray from just a few months after Röntgen's discovery. Many people don't realise that you don't need a photographic plate to see an X-ray image. A fluorescent screen is perfectly good enough. X-rays coming from the cathode ray tube here are partially blocked by skeletal bones and a bullet, creating shadows on any suitable fluorescent screen. A device called a fluoroscope allows the surgeon to see X-ray shadows live. He locates and removes a bullet. X-ray studies have taught us more about atoms and molecules than any other method. This is because the wavelength of X-rays is similar to the spacing of atoms in solids, which means X-rays are diffracted by solids. Here are spacings in a crystal of water. Within the molecule, the hydrogen and oxygen nuclei are about 10 nanometers apart. The oxygen nuclei are about 27 nanometers apart. These are ideal distances to probe with X-ray diffraction. The Braggs showed how X-ray diffraction patterns can be used to find out the locations and spacing of atoms in a crystal. A huge breakthrough. And it was through X-ray diffraction that Crick, Franklin, Watson and Wilkins revealed the helical structure of DNA. Moreover, there is significant overlap between the energy ranges of X-ray photons and the energy ranges of electrons bound to the nuclei of atoms. Henry Moseley took advantage of this in a brilliant experiment that validated the Rutherford-Bohr atomic model and unveiled the true basis of the periodic table. All of this began with Röntgen's discovery in 1895, one of the most far-reaching in the history of science. <laughs>